Well, our final speaker of the day is familiar to many of you. Dr. Jarrett Zigon is the Porterfield Chair in Biomedical Ethics and is a professor of anthropology. He directs the bioethics program and minor here at UVA. He's also the founding director of the Center for da Data Ethics and Justice, which will be part of the new School of Data Sciences. He's a faculty fellow here at the Institute and regularly contributes to our conferences, including an article that will be part of a special issue of social research that arose from our conference on algorithms last spring. He's the author of five books, including Morality, an Anthropological Perspective, and HIV is God's Blessing, and numerous articles. His latest book, A War on People, examines the effects on, of the drug war. His research has focused on the anthropology of ethics, uh, especially developing an anthropology that engages critical hermeneutics. His talk today arises from this engagement between critical hermeneutics and ethnographic research on drug use. Please, please join me in welcoming Dr. Zigon. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't be here most of the day, so I, I'm uh, uncertain how this will fit in with the rest of the talks, but I, ho I hope it will to some extent. Um, but I will say that I realize I'm sometimes a bit of an odd cat uh, in that um, I've been doing research on addiction and, and, and therapy and, and rehabilitation and, 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 um, and especially with active drug users who are political activists for about 15 years now. And, um, and I've gotten to the point uh, with my last two books where I, I've, I've, I've been looking to these active drug users um, for inspiration and as inspiration and as models for how to address our contemporary condition of precarity, uh, loss of community, um, uh, and, and disappointment. Um, so, so in my, my most recent book, which this um, is kind of carved out of, I, 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 I try to uh, look at this archive of research to try to articulate uh, a theory of, 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 of ethics and political activity around community building that we can find from active drug users. Um, so I look forward to, to your your thoughts and response. I'll start with a quote. It's a war on people. It's a war on communities. It's a war on entire segments of cities. This is how a New York City anti-drug war agonist or activist once described the drug war to me and how it is understood and articulated by innumerable other such agonists around the globe. And I should, should have said this before I started. The anti, what I call the anti-drug war movement is, I think, likely one of the largest and most widely dispersed uh, political movements on the, on the globe. Uh, there are um, so-called drug user unions um, um, headed by and, 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 and participated in by active drug users. And by drug users, I mean mostly heroin and crack cocaine users. Um, Almost, in almost every country on the planet. Um, and they uh, mobilize in all kinds of ways locally and internationally, including meeting in international conferences to put together strategy on how to work together to address the drug war and its various um, uh, consequences, addiction being only one of them. So when representatives of governments, states, and international institutions speak of the drug war, they speak as though it is a quasi-metaphorical description of the benevolent attempt on their part to protect national and global populations from apparently dangerous substances. This rhetoric suggests that the war is waged on these substances, and this, along with the medicalization of the disease model of addiction and its therapeutic treatment, results in the contemporary dominant discourse of the war on drugs as protective policies more akin to public health initiatives than any actually fought war. When on occasion the drug war is articulated as an actual war, the enemy is, for the most part, officially marked as the dealers, the cartels, and the bad guys that threaten communities. Populations in this narrative must be protected. This is not how the global anti-drug war movement understands the drug war, and it is not how, it is how innumerable drug users around the globe experience it. 
For them, it is indeed a war on people. This war, as far as they can tell, does not protect a population as much as it creates a particular kind of population, for it is only by means of the discursive, structural, and physical violence enacted against certain kinds of people, in this case, drug users, that a protectable population comes into being. Put another way, a protectable population never exists prior to the enactment of a biopolitical will that creates that population through acts of exclusionary force against another and covers over that force with the rhetorical discourse of security. First declared in 1971 by Richard Nixon, the war on drugs has become a highly militarized, punitive, exceedingly expensive international war on people, waged to some extent by nearly every country on the globe. With the US federal government having spent over $1 trillion since its inception, and all the countries on the globe spending well over $1 billion annually, the result of the drug war seems to be little more than the violent consumption of drug user lives. From the mass incarceration of a significant proportion of a generation of African American men in the United States, to the street battles, assassinations, and collateral damage that has led to over 100,000 deaths in Mexico since 2006, from the torturous rehabilitation conditions found throughout Russia, to the extrajudicial killings by the military and police in 2003 of at least 2,275 suspected drug offenders in Thailand, a phenomenon, it should be noted, that is being repeated at this very moment in the Philippines, to the preventable health risks users and non-users alike are exposed to everywhere as the result of stigmatization and the lack of harm reduction programs, the drug war seemingly has resulted in little more than the death, suffering, and objection of millions of users and non-users alike. Indeed, the 200,000 annual drug war deaths equals approximately three-fifths of total deaths in the so-called war on terror since 2001. In other words, as it is well put by a Canadian anti-drug war organization, the drug war as a war on people provides the conditions within which people who use drugs become expendable beings. Meanwhile, drug cartels continue to accumulate wealth and power that in some instances far surpasses that of sovereign nations and states increasingly tighten security and surveillance that impacts the lives of entire populations. Increasingly, social and political theorists consider our contemporary condition one of war. For example, Giorgio Gambin has characterized our contemporary political paradigm as that of civil war. And Michael Hart and Antonio Negri provide perhaps the most sustained theoretical analysis of how this is so. Yet the primary example utilized in both cases is the war on terror. I agree with these and other thinkers who argue that this glo global condition, who argue for this global condition of war. But if we want to understand that war as a form of governance entails, then we must go beyond analyses of the war on terror, counterinsurgency, or other forms of perpetual war between and within nation states and those groups that seek to overthrow or harass them. The drug war illustrates well that in the contemporary condition of things, war as governance is primarily a war fought, on poten fought potentially anywhere and against anyone. One of the fundamental assumptions of this essay then is that if modernity is best understood in terms of a biopolitics that has been primarily concerned with the care of populations and life, then this was only possible by means of war as an integral aspect of biopolitical governance. And although war occasionally manifests as war against an external enemy in the form of another sovereign power, war as a necessary aspect of biopolitical governance is primarily waged as wars on internal enemies or wars on people. Because wars on people, such as the drug war, are central to biopolitical governance, it is important to recognize that those against whom these wars are waged remain perpetually bound up with the very power that wages war against them. As Judith Butler puts it, such internal enemies remain in a situation of forcible exposure to the exercise of state power freed from the constraints of all law. As such, the people against whom such wars are fought uh, are, are waged remain ever present as the necessary internal other that provides the validating foundation of not only the truth, but more importantly, 
the rightness of the biopolitical order. War in this sense is the general ontological condition for the contemporary order of things. If we want to understand this ontological condition of war, then we must interrogate the ways in which this war is waged against ordinary people right here in the midst of everyday life and how these people struggle against it. Today I'd like to talk about one of the ways in which the global anti-drug war movement attempts to counter this ontological condition of war by bringing into existence an otherwise condition of attuned care. In doing so, I will begin from Roberto Esposito's attempts to offer a revived notion of community characterized above all by mutual obligation to care. In contrast to what he calls the immunitary logic of biopolitics, that is the logic of inclusive exclusion, Esposito has articulated an affirmative biopolitics grounded on the open vulnerability of finite existence and the necessary intertwining of a community of finite beings. Esposito perhaps best describes this notion of community by considering the etymological constitution of communitas in terms of the cum of being with and the munis of obligatory care that this being with entails, an obligation that takes the form of a gift. Thus for Esposito, the open community ontologically grounded by what I call attuned care perhaps best describes the human condition of finite beings that are always already ecstatically intertwined with one another. As, we will, as will become clear, this is what I contend the anti-drug war movement intends when they articulate and enact their sense of community through their political and ethical activity. In doing so, they enact the care of a communis as a tuned being with that lets be all of those who arrive to become attuned however they may, that is, as the singularity that they are. This may seem like a strange notion of care if it is contrasted with care as caring for or taking care of. Indeed, with the contemporary dominance of biopolitics, this caring for and taking care of life has too often become a process of normalization rather than attunement to the singularity of whoever arrives. Such normalization is particularly obvious when it is realized that the life for which biopolitical care cares is life in general or the life of the population, as Foucault would put it, rather than any particular life at all. This regime of care and the anonymous care it provides is precisely one of the primary concerns of anti-drug war agonists. As I write in my book, A War on People, their vision goes beyond the exclusionary normalization of biopolitics, the extreme of which is enacted through the deadly violence of wars on people, such as the drug war by seeking to open politics and community and worlds to whoever and however they arrive through the enactment of attuned care. Statuses of belonging are not prerequisites for care within these worlds. In my book, I detail many examples of this community of whoever arrives enacted by the global anti-drug war movement. For example, the fact of the overwhelming number of drug users who are not from Vancouver or even Canada that are welcomed in the downtown east side by those already there. The way in which Vocal New York has recently made significant attempts to welcome Russian-speaking users living, oftentimes undocumented, in the city. The fact that the uh, Danish Drug Users Union, um, from its start, consisted of several non-Danish users and regularly welcomes what they call drug war refugees from other countries. And the fact that, as I've witnessed over and over again in many different places, a drug user from anywhere can show up at any user union or allied organization and be welcomed with and offered, among other things, food, shelter, and companionship, as well as the drugs he or she may need. These examples of attuned care not only attest to the non-normative politics of the anti-drug war movement, but also to its enactment of an open community of those who happen by. As such, they disclose the solidarity of those who share nothing other than their finitude within the precarious conditions of the widely diffused complexity of war. <coughs> a condition that may have excluded them from a normalized humanity, but has opened an onto-ethical political possibility for the emergence of an otherwise. This possibility for an otherwise emerges through the enactment of attuned care. This is an important point. For unlike the way in which ontology is too often considered 
and perhaps especially so today within the social humanities, ontological conditions are neither the culture-like walls within which certain practices and cosmologies are possible, nor are they the background against which these make sense. <coughs> Rather, ontological conditions emerge through the everyday activity, through everyday activity. <coughs> Similar to how Agamben writes of the ontology of a form of life as a being that is its mode of being, which is its welling up and is continually generated by its manner of being, so too I intend ontological conditions is that which wells up, as Agamben puts it, in that very instant of everyday activity. In this sense, ontological conditions are more like the affective forces that both enable and constrain habits than containers that mold their contents. And just as the affect emerges along with the enactment of the habit and does not precede it in a causal chain, so too ontological conditions emerge along with those everyday activities they condition. Being, then, is more like a habit than a container, mold, idea, or horizon. And this holds true, I suggest, whether we are speaking of human being or non-human being. The offshoot of this is that multiple ontological conditions regularly emerge. We live in worlds of constant flux and endless potentiality. That we almost never recognize this is a matter of the ways in which certain ontological traditions inframe particular possibilities while excluding others, the result of which are the habits of being that our environment, as well as ourselves, either do or do not acquire. Power, in one form or another, shapes habit, possibilities, and ultimately being. And this is why we must always speak in terms of the onto-ethical political, and why if we seek in otherwise, we must think and act accordingly. In the rest of this essay, I will show that attuned care is the primary practice through which the anti-drug war movement is onto-ethical politically struggling, struggling to build new worlds. <coughs> you have to excuse me. I think I've been talking too much all day. And my voice is finally giving. On a globe increasingly characterized by wars on people, building worlds where such open communities of attuned care can gather has become a political and existential imperative. In my book, I try to show how the anti-drug war movement has responded to the demand of this imperative, and that perhaps contrary to how most perceived drug users, the political activity that some of them are now doing provides a model for imagining how others can also respond and begin to build worlds otherwise. In the rest of this talk, I will show how this is so. Consider Anne, a leader of Vocal New York, which is um, the drug users union in New York City, and probably the most significant drug user union in the United States, and, um, and, and one of the most significant in the world. So consider Anne, a leader of Vocal New York, the city's drug user union. Come here, darling, give me a hug, Anne says to nearly everyone she interacts with at any vocal event. Anne is a hugging machine. Well over six foot with a frame to match, it is always just a little amusing to watch people who have never met Anne react to her when she says this as she is already initiating the hug. <laughs> Anne says this is <laughs> because they are afraid of human touch. For as Anne knows well, Many of the users who are vocal members or who the union tries to recruit or simply work with, and in fact many users all around the globe, have been systematically excluded from the intimacy of human touch. Whether because their parents gave up on them because of their use, or their spouse left because of the hardships drug use can sometimes cause, or because they had been incarcerated for years, or because of the precarious housing or homelessness many of them endure, there are many reasons why drug users in New York City and elsewhere rarely have the opportunity for the intimacy that is essential to being human. Here I do not intend intimacy in the terms of what Elizabeth Favinelli calls the intimate event of love, which can be understood as central to the liberal heteronormative hegemony. Rather, by intimacy, I intend what I take to be an essential existential need for the intertwining connectivity of being with 
and touch perhaps most particularly opens a possibility for such being with. Intimate touch then can be considered as the felt bodily materiality through which being with emerges. As I've been trying to make clear so far, the cum of being with that intimacy can initiate is central to the political project of the anti-drug war movement because it entails the moonness of the obligation and gift of attuned care, together which found the possibility for the community of whoever arrives. Why this particular kind of political project is so vital to the anti-drug war movement becomes clearer when we better understand the theory of addiction that is at the core of the drug war <coughs> and the way in which the drug war actually perpetuates the very conditions in which problematic drug use occurs. As I show in detail in the book, the drug war is driven by the quote-unquote mindset, as a lot of people call it, that a drug user as addict, quote unquote, is consubstantially enslaved to an evil drug that renders the addict less than human and akin to shit, trash, and waste. The result is the drug war imaginary of the stereotypical addict who sits alone outside train stations or on park benches, oftentimes in his own filth, looking to steal your money when he's not nodding off in some corner. This imaginary feeds into the normalizing desire of our contemporary condition, resulting in the fact that the only kind of care available for the addict, when, they care, when any care is available at all, is that biopolitical care that demands that the addict become clean. But this is only part of the ideological story, this is, this is, but this is only part of the ideological story behind the drug war. For the question remains as to why a person actually becomes addicted to a substance in the first place. The ideological answer lies in the evilness of the drug. For according to Bruce Alexander, a critic of the drug war and a psychologist of addiction who has taught and done research in Vancouver since the 1970s, <coughs> the theory of addiction that founds the drug war is what he calls the myth of demon drugs. According to this myth, Drugs are evil because they are modern day demons that after having been ingested just once will possess the user and consubstantially enslave him, rendering the addict more akin to a zombie than a human. Thus zero tolerance is necessary, so the myth goes, because a substance itself is so demonically dangerous that any use at all will very likely result in addiction. With this foundational myth then, the only way to prevent the demon drugs from spreading evil and destroying our way of life is to make the world drug free, as the United Nations declared its drug war goal to be in 1998. Thus the myth of the demon drug and the zombie addicts it produces has resulted in the international attempt to eradicate all drugs, which almost by definition entails the eradication of those who have become possessed by them. As with most exclusionary projects, drug warriors have found justification for this foundational myth in scientific research, most famously so in research on the self-administration of drugs by experimental animals such as caged rats. Scientists and drug warriors conclude from these tests that if rats, as well as mice and monkeys, <coughs> Isolated in small laboratory cages continue to self-administer drugs to the detriment of their health, then there must be something about the drug as a substance that compels this self-destructive behavior. Thus, as one prominent American scientist concluded from his, this research, I have to infer that if heroin were easily available to everyone, and if, it were, if there were no social pressure of any kind to discourage heroin use, a very large number of people would become heroin addicts. In other words, the claim being made here is that scientific research supports the violent waging of the drug warrior, here euphemistically articulated as social pressure and discouragement, so as to protect populations from those demon drugs. Alexander and his colleagues, however, began to wonder if perhaps these rats continued to self-administer the drug offered them not because they could not resist the evil demon drug once they had been exposed to it, but rather as a pharmacological relief to the distress of being housed in isolated metal cages, subjected to surgical implantations, and tethered to a self-injection apparatus. 
In other words, they asked if the problematic overusage of drugs by these caged animals was a consequence of their isolated, torturous, and thus existentially distressful conditions, and not the drug itself. In the attempt to answer this question, Alexander and his colleagues built Rat Park, a spacious laboratory environment about 200 times the size of a standard laboratory cage with empty cans, wood scraps, and other rat-friendly goodies spread about, and which held 16 to 20 rats of both sexes. Running a series of experiments to compare the self-administration of morphine by rats living in Rat Park with those isolated in small laboratory cages, Alexander and his colleagues found that at no point did the rats of Rat Park exhibit anything that looked to them like addiction. Although some of the Rat Park rats occasionally self-administered morphine, the rats in isolated cages continued to administer at much higher and frequent rates, and under some conditions, as much as 20 times more than those in Rat Park. This outcome remained the case even when the researchers forced the rats of Rat Park to consume morphine for weeks, thus assuring that when given the opportunity to self-administer, they would be experiencing withdrawal, and thus theoretically, would be more likely to continue high use of morphine in order to avoid withdrawal symptoms. But even this did not work, as ultimately, no matter what Alexander and his colleagues did to get the rats of Rat Park addicted, they simply could not do so as these rats seemed to prefer the sociality, fun, and sexual pleasure of an environment attuned to their ratness over the effects of the so-called demon drug. In Rat Park, rats simply had no need to pharmacologically relieve themselves from physical or existential pain because their social and living conditions caused very little of this pain. The Rat Park experiments then, se then seemed to confirm the interpretation that problematic overuse of drugs by rats in isolated laboratory cages is more the result of the conditions of their being isolated and under constant distress than that of the drug itself. The results of the Rat Park experiments, however, were just too radical and disruptive for the mindset of the drug war. And eventually, Alexander and his colleagues had their funding cut because of it. And although since then the results of these experiments have been replicated several times, governments, the biomedical pharmaceutical complex, mass media, and most of the scientific establishment to this day refuse to acknowledge, and in some cases to publish these findings. For to do so would be to acknowledge that the foundational myth that supports the violent exclusion of the drug war is false. If this myth appears to remain plausible then, perhaps this is because the drug war itself brings into being and perpetuates human versions of those isolated cages, what I have called zones of uninhabitability, in which self-medication to cope with the fact of anxiety-ridden isolation and loneliness remains one of the few possibilities available to survive these conditions. As Dean Wilson, a well-known Canadian anti-drug war agonist once put it, addiction is a disease of loneliness. And thus the cure is not more exclusion and violence, but instead the rebuilding of worlds conditioned by attuned care, within which the intertwined connectivity of being with can become the new non-normative norm. This is the political project of the anti-drug war movement, and Anne is participating in its realization one hug at a time. In fact, Anne has become one of the most familiar faces and effective leaders of Vocal. She runs meetings, she recruits new members, she meets with politicians, and she is front and center at nearly every action. At each of these, she is giving hugs. For example, when she is introduced at a membership meeting to give a talk on a particular topic, such as stop and frisk policing, she begins by asking all the members present to stand up and hug the person near them. Or when she goes to a local harm reduction center to recruit new members for vocal, she begins by giving each person present a hug. When I asked her once why she does this, she said, everybody can always talk, but it's better, you know, you can't help nobody when everybody talks at one time. But if everybody sings together and hug each other, you notice that there's a calmness in the air. In contrast to talking at one time, a phrase that suggests the banality of endless opinion and idle chatter, Anne here wants to emphasize how the intimacy of the hug 
and the harmony of singing allow connectivity or being with to emerge. The calmness that this connectivity carries with it is a mood that as Anne describes, that as Anne describes the effect of hugs to me on one occasion makes people more comfortable, which allows them in turn to open up, to trust her enough to tell her what they may not tell others and to, and to hear what she has to say in return. This intimate mood brought about through the hug can be understood as the atmospheric condition of attuned care. Moods are not subjective or psychological states. Rather, moods are an all-enveloping force that comes over us and things together and go a long way toward conditioning the way we are in a world at any particular moment. In this sense, moods are more akin to an atmosphere than an emotion or one's character. Furthermore, moods are not permanent. They do not define one's way of being in the world from here on out forever. But moods' effects do have lasting effects. And it is in this sense that I want to say that Anne's hugs have lasting political, ethical, and ultimately ontological effects. For these hugs bring about intimately mooded moments in which people become open and trusting in their being together there, and in so doing, open the possibility for attuned care to become central to the everyday ways of being within the, within the worlds Anne is helping to build. Indeed, I would suggest that it is just this intimate mood that Anne conjures that has made her not only Vocal's most effective recruiter, but also increasingly one of its most recognizable and effective political agonists. For the trust she is able to conjure with intimate mood can open the possibility for the attuned care of another user just as much as it can be an expedient tactic in a political confrontation. Terence, another vocal leader, once told me that he thought the most important mission of the user's union is to help people overcome the dehumanizing effects of the drug war. As he put it, we have to see what we can do to help individuals address this and make them feel comfortable in their whole. To become comfortable in their whole, or as I would rather put it, to become comfortable in one's being. This is the political vision Terence articulates. This existential comfort, this trust, this openness is largely made possible by the attuned care enacted through the kinds of intimate moods I briefly described here. Against the dehumanizing and isolating conditions of drug war situations, anti-drug war agonists around the globe are attempting to show politicians, police, medical staff, and nearly everyone else that the fantasy the drug war is based upon actually creates a nightmare for those it claims to help. But before that political showing can take place, before any political activity against the drug war can begin at all, the first step for many within the anti-drug war movement is to help drug users escape the loneliness they experience, the self-loathing spiral many have fallen into, and the general lack of existential comfort many have as a result of the isolating and dehumanizing conditions of the drug war. This attuned care becomes possible because of the intimate moons conjured in the various communities these political agonists are building. Consider the downtown east side of Vancouver. Throughout the book, A War on People, I emphasize that the political activity in the downtown east side has become, to a great extent, a model for the global anti-drug war movement. This is so not only because of the tactics used, but perhaps most importantly because of the long-term vision of the political activity in the world that has emerged as a result. I have described this world as an intertwined one, in which its labor, service, housing, entertainment, and health therapeutic sectors are all networked such that by entering this world at any point, for example, a job at one of the social enterprises, one can easily access any other, for example, good and adequate housing. Because of this, I've described the downtown east side as an attuned world. We could also say that as a result of the politics of world building done there, the downtown east side is best described as having an ontological condition of attuned care. And just very briefly, if, if no one, if, just in case someone doesn't know the downtown east side of Vancouver, um, this is a, a, a neighborhood in Vancouver that just a few square blocks where um, there are uh, over 10,000 active drug users. Um, 
in the mid 90s, it was uh, found that it had the highest rate of uh, HIV uh, transmission in, in the developed world. And as a result of that, a number of activists who were already working on the ground there decided they needed to start doing things differently. Uh, probably the most famous thing that came out of that is the safe injection site that's now located there and for a long time was the first and only one in all of North America. But kind of coming out of that site was uh, a whole world of different uh, um, possibilities. For example, various social enterprise businesses where drug users could work, uh, that uh, businesses attuned to drug users rather than drug users being forced to be good nine to five workers, for example. Um, a bank, which I will talk about in a minute, uh, and various other um, art galleries and, and, and gardens and, and therapeutic opportunities for, uh, for people who uh, live there, oh, including a lot of housing, which is great. So throughout the book, I show, maybe I'm going to read this right now. Throughout the book, I show how this condition of attuned care within the downtown east side emerged and the kinds of possibilities it allowed. Thus, for example, I argue that the downtown east side can, for the most part, be understood as a world in which harm reduction has become a part of ordinary everyday life. This world, to a great extent, can be characterized as one that is now a relatively safe zone for drug use. Unlike, unlike most other harm reduction services around the globe that can only be found at relatively, isol um, hmm, relatively isolated, disconnected clinics, which tend to put a lot of emphasis on the normalization of the participants who go there, the downtown east side has become an entire world in which harm reduction services are easily accessed within minutes of anywhere one may be, and accessed in a way that lets be whoever does. The social enterprise jobs are another example of how the onto infrastructure of the downtown east side gives way to the condition of attuned care. These jobs are by definition attuned to those who work them. Thus, for example, working at the chocolate cafe or the vintage clothes shop, or the grocery store, or the arts and crafts shop, or any of the other social enterprise jobs does not entail that the employee conform to the rigid standards of a responsible nine to five worker. Rather, these jobs attune to the ways of being of those who work them. But so too, employees must attune themselves to the ways of being of a job. This co-attunement then provides the conditions in which work is a possibility for anyone who might happen by. Not only does this condition open the possibility that anyone is now able to get a paycheck, which is indeed important within the larger drug war condition that excludes drug users from most job opportunities, but more importantly, this condition of attuned care allows for what several of my interlocutors called connectivity. What I hope to have made clear throughout the book and here today is that being connected is an attuned, in an attuned manner is not simply a matter of standing over and against some other person or thing and feeling a connection because of an understood shared interest or obligation. Rather, an attuned connectivity, or simply attunement, is better understood as an ontological responsivity through which the being of diverse existence become intertwined such that what is at stake is not interest or obligation, but the very existence of this intertwinement. That is to say, what is at stake is being as such, and that stakeness that entails care. I've been trying to argue that it is precisely because of this attuned connectivity and the condition of attuned care this entails that so many drug users finally feel that they now have a place to dwell despite the difficulties that remain in the downtown <coughs> east side. In other words, this condition of attuned care is one in which those who dwell there are regularly caught up in an atmospheric mood of intimacy. Therefore, I would like to finish this essay today with one last example of how the attuned care of the downtown east side gives way to such an atmospheric mood and the being together with that this condition and mood allow. More or less at the geographical center of the downtown east side sits a bank. For years, those living in the neighborhood had no bank as all the big commercial banks shut down their branches in the downtown east side and those in the surrounding neighborhoods increasingly hired security guards to keep so-called undesirables out. Being a resident of the downtown east side is for most others in Vancouver, by definition, being an undesirable. This evacuation of the banking industry from the neighborhood for the most part resulted in a situation in which most of the residents 
of the downtown east side had no access to financial institutions other than cash checking and money order companies that charged a hefty fee for any transaction. Thus, thousands of residents who already lived quite precarious lives were further marginalized. Eventually, one of the main anti-drug war organizations working in the downtown east side convinced the Vancouver Area Credit Union to provide the banking infrastructure for a new bank in the neighborhood, which the organization now operates with its own personnel. Today, the bank offers basic banking services for a low monthly fee, does not require a permanent address for its customers, and welcomes all who arrive, no matter how they look or smell. Having been planned, organized, established, and run, so to be attuned to those who arrive, rather than to exclude those who do not fit a preconceived idea of who counts as a proper bank customer. The bank is an opening onto the world of the downtown east side where new possibilities for becoming regularly emerge. Part of what allows for this attunement is that the bank is more than simply a financial institution seeking profit where one goes to do a banking transaction. Rather, the bank is also a place where during the time of my research, people could hang out in the lobby or in the front of the bank and socialize with friends or anyone who might pass by or have a free cup of coffee offered in the lobby and read announcements of political, artistic, and other events going on in the neighborhood or even for a short period, get a crack pipe from the crack pipe vending machine in the lobby. In other words, the bank is not predefined in its exclusionary and limited possibilities of what it could be but rather was designed as an open and attuned space that allowed for potentialities to emerge as realizable possibilities. Thus, this bank not only provides conditions of attuned care by means of its financial services, but perhaps more significantly, the bank also offers an intimate atmosphere that gives way to attuned connectivity because it is an open space that welcomes all who arrive to become together in a communal manner. An example of how this is so, and thus why the bank is central to the attuned care of a community of whoever arrives, is the opera performed in the bank lobby at least once a year. Every Christmas season, a local opera company performs in the lobby, and occasionally additional performances are put on throughout the year. One such additional performance was a celebration of May Day in 2015. Yes, to be clear, this was an opera held in a bank to celebrate International Workers' Day. <laughs> in addition to the free performance that started at 7 in the evening, a free dinner was provided to anyone who happened by. This is perhaps the most obvious example of how the political activity of the downtown east side is a creative and experimental politics of world building attempting to bring about an otherwise. For the very idea of performing an opera and providing a free meal in the lobby of a bank is not one that normally occurs, let alone one that is enacted. This is an experimental politics that does not begin, for example, with either an is or an ought, but instead with why not? This is politics as creative experimentation with an otherwise. As I walked down Hastings Street toward the bank, I could already see traces of the operatic event several blocks away, as nearly everyone I passed on the street was eating a bowl of chili con carne. Drug users around the globe struggle with access to proper nutrition, and those living in the downtown east side, unfortunately, are no different. So if for no other reason, the operatic event that day provided the possibility that at least on this day, anyone who might pass by would be offered a free hot meal. But this event should not be considered as a standard biopolitical humanitarian meal of the soup kitchen. Rather, the attuned care of the bank that day was the entirety of the operatic event, and not the meal on its own. For it was the communal experience of the performance, the being with in the midst of creativity, and indeed the shared experience of eating a meal together there and then that I want to suggest was the enactment of attuned care that gave way to an intimate atmospheric mood that day. When I walked into the bank, the lobby was packed with people sitting on folding chairs as the operatic performance was already underway. Just in front of the teller's desks and surrounded on all, on all other sides by the audience, the four-person performance, accompanied by a small band, transformed the space into an intimate musical theater. People of all ages, some First Nation peoples, some Black, some Asian, and some White, sat transfixed on the performers. 
Occasionally, a young child jumped off his father's lap and ran toward the performance, stopping just before crashing into one of the singers, and then ran back to the open arms of his father. While most watched intently, some nodded off in their seats. Did they do so from the calming effects of the music, boredom, or the effects of heroin? The answer was not particularly obvious, and no one seemed to care. Throughout the performance, people walked in and out of the lobby, some just out of curiosity, some realizing after a period of time that this was not their cup of tea, others looking to see if there was any food left. Out front on the sidewalk, just as many people gathered as did inside. Standing outside, still able to hear the performance, they talked about it and the food and any number of other topics of conversation. They, like those inside, simply seemed to enjoy the possibility of being together in the, atmosphere, in the atmosphere of the operatic performance. When the performance was over and the standing ovation died down, some went home, but many just slowly lingered around the lobby and outside the bank and on the surrounding streets for several hours. They talked with one another, some got high, they talked about which part they liked most and which performer they thought sang and danced best. Some sang themselves and others laughed. The next day, as I walked down the street, I heard a few still talking about the performance as the atmospheric mood conjured by last evening's performance still lingered. The bank for those couple of hours was both bank and not bank. It was a bank in the process of becoming something else that tomorrow would become bank again. The politics of world, bait, world building underway in the downtown east side has been as successful as it is because it has focused on this kind of creative and experimental political activity meant to enact attuned care and provide the conditions for an otherwise world. This is a politics as a process of poetic building. That is a political poetic building of a world where a community of those without community can gather and dwell and in so doing, be with one another in conditions of attuned care. The result of the political activity that has built this world of the downtown east side is that there now exists a world, as one of the key political actors there has put it, where one can be a human being with other human beings, where no one tells anyone how to live their fucking life, where non-judgment is perhaps the primary ethical value, and where collectively people try to be there with and for one another. This is perhaps the best description of what a world conditioned by attuned care looks like. This world of the downtown east side is not a utopia realized, however. There remains much suffering, pain, death, and exclusion from the larger world of Vancouver. What is politically significant about what is happening in the downtown east side is not that they are somehow magically discovered how to eradicate suffering, far from it, but rather that through political activity, such as building a bank that can also sometimes be an opera theater, and through which one can also be connected to housing or employment or artistic or recreational or health possibilities around the neighborhood, through building such a world that is intertwined and attuned to itself and its constituents, this political activity has also built a world in which those dwelling there can find care as the singularity that they are. In other words, this politics of world building is creatively experimenting with ways in which a world can become a place where those who dwell there need not be in some predefined manner, but instead are let be in their singularity, and as such, become intertwined within a relationality that offers the gift of care. Thank you.